Welcome to another episode of Talking with Kevin and Son. Today, this episode is brought to you by RMK Productions and the 10 United Podcast Network. Through the power of our story, our mission is to uplift, share the power of our voices, inspire, share stories, experience, and perspectives using the framework of teaching, learning, and modeling. Our purpose is hope, helping other people every single day. According to the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention, suicide deaths are the 10th leading cause of death here in our country with over 47,000 people who had committed suicide according to the records of 2019. That's well over 1.3 million people that attempted suicide. That is the same population as New, New Hampshire. Today, our guest is a survivor of suicide death in her family and has put her story in the pages of her new book, Kids of King. Our motivation to bring in this story is hope, helping other people every single day. This is a real conversation on suicide awareness and prevention. Maybe through the power of this author's story and her faith, we'll create some unity amongst these people in America. Or maybe if you stay, stay around long enough, this story will help someone near you overcome the insurmountable situation that may just save a life instead of costing someone's life. So today, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome our guest, author, graduate of Central State University, Delta Sigma Theta sorority, and just good human being um, and has a strong commitment to her face, author of the new book, Kids of King, Miss Naomi J. Kenny, welcome to Talking Wit, W-I-T, Kevin and Son. How you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you. Thank you for this honor and for the ability to be here and to share my message uh, with everyone and to hopefully save a life. It's well, anything we to do. I am hoping to do this. And to our listeners, I want to tell you, keep this in mind. All right. Education is not designed to make you comfortable. It's designed to make you think. It is the holidays. And for many of us, we celebrate these holidays and we welcome them in with all the festivities and the accoutrements that come with it. And for other days, it is like carrying the rock of Gibraltar on your on your chest. Yeah. All right. Yeah. It's too heavy for you to bear. Yeah. And sometimes we isolate ourselves and we make decisions that may not be popular to other people. That's right. I am hoping through Naomi's story. And I've read not all of your book, uh, only because I just got it a couple of days ago. But I'm also hoping that the elephant that's in the room for some of us, and I personally have been there, we will see light at the end of the tunnel through this conversation. So with that said, bring us back a little bit. You're from Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay. There's a town, you know, we, we know King's record, Bootsy Collins and all of those people, Elvis Presley, some of the um, music people have come through there. We also know Cincinnati, um, was in the Super Bowl la last year. Go Bengals. Hey, My brothers and sisters will be happy. That's right. Uh, we, we keep also, trying. We also know <laughs> it's the home of the Chili King. Mm -hmm. right. Oh, yeah. Home. If you go through Cincinnati, got to eat some chili. Yeah. Yeah, they have some chili. But mm -hmm. where, does this, where does this story begin? And the second part to this, why did you put it in a book? So, um... The story is, is that in December 1967, um, six days before Christmas, uh, my father was Robert Lee Kinney Sr. Uh, he he took his own life and he left my mom with nine children. And I am the youngest of those children. And so uh, for me, it was like a, a coming back to trying to figure out everything that occurred. And so um, my book is the impact of that event. Um, and uh, the impact on our lives, what occurred specifically, because I had a lot of questions about what actually went down and um, how it has affected us, but how we uh, really have, it's a testimonial, about, uh, a testimonial about how we really have turned our lives around and turned it into a mission and a ministry of uh, letting people know that we're all going to uh, carry a cross, we're all going to go through some difficulties uh, in life, but um, just encouraging people uh, to lean into their faith and their family and really love one another and to care for one another. So it's a message that I wanted to get out there. But my father also sang at King Records. And a lot of people don't know about King Records, but King Records was 
two blocks away from where I grew up. And there were many greats that recorded there, like Les Paul, Otis Williams, Bootsy Collins. A lot of people know he's, I think it's your frat brother. He's a um, way to go. And D, James Brown, uh, he also recorded there too. So they, uh, Sid Nathan at the time, who was the owner of King Records, he went around to local high schools and went to their talent nights. And he happened to show up at one of my father's talent nights when he was singing. And he ended up recruiting him and he ended up singing at King Records. They recruited a lot of local talent uh, there in Cincinnati, Ohio, and in Evanston, the community that I grew up in. So I wrote a lot about that and how all this great talent uh, was being like solicited and uh, coalesced there at King Records. And so I write about the um, history of King Records. A lot of people don't know about it. We had Motown, we had Stax in Tennessee, and we had King Records in Cincinnati, Ohio. And those are like the main, main three outlets of um, great R&B, country music, gospel music. Um, but those are that's where the outlets uh, went from there to the radio, uh, to those uh, main uh, musical outlets. Um, so my father had this great, be uh, beautiful singing voice. But uh, my father was also uh, too subject to the um, tumultuousness of uh, just a very turbulent time in the 60s. And he was biracial. And um, due to that, he had a lot of issues to deal with on the white side and on the black side, on both sides. And so, um, and he really um, received a lot of that when he went to the uh, the army uh, as well, too. So um, he went to this mental uh, situation where, you know, the oppression is what really got to him. And this happened to a lot of black men at the time. After I did a lot of research, I realized that that was the way out for many, uh, uh, away from that oppression, was to just do away with their own life. And they felt that it would be better for their family and everything. So um, I do have that um, question and everything I was so curious about uh, from the Black man's perspective. I'm a woman, I didn't really realize that. But after I started interviewing my brothers and other family members, I realized that um, our whole family was in crisis. But a lot of Black families at that time were in crisis. And so it was just a very difficult time for a lot of people, specifically in Cincinnati, Ohio. Cincinnati has this reputation, unfortunately, for being the riot capital, capital racial riot capital uh, of the U.S. And I'll talk about the history of those riots that occurred. And ironically, one occurred just months right before my father took his own life. So I was able to go back and kind of trace the steps of history, which is something that a lot of suicide survivors do. Um, they go back and try and figure out what happened, what really went down. And for me, within that whole process of putting it into a book, it was very healing. It was, I mean, I literally was crying at the keyboard uh, quite frequently, but it was something that I had to get out, was something that I had to go through and be able to... Um, really tell the story so that others would understand um, the challenges that our country are going through. And I, I really came back when I saw everything happening January 6th on the television and realizing we are in the same place. We haven't gone any further with the racial issues. So that was the thing that really sparked me. I had all these notes for years, for like over 10 years, I've been researching my dad's death. But when I saw all the turmoil um, racial turmoil, Black Lives Matter, all of that that was occurring. And it really just culminated with January 6th, where it was like, darn it, we got to get back to the keyboard. We must finish the book and just ask America, why haven't we improved? Why can't we get better at this? Don't we know we're like killing ourselves and killing one another and doing so? So that was why I wanted to put it into a book. Well, you, you know, if you remember the movie, and I first saw this um, as a play. Tom Hanks played a um, an, um, uh, military attorney. And one of the lines in the movie is that, you know, the truth. You can't handle the truth. You can't yeah. handle the truth. When you ask yeah. why, you know, that at least for, for, for men and men of color, why suicide um, is ever an option, you have to think about and this is the reason why I say, you know, education is not designed to make you comfortable. It's designed to make you think. Ask yourself, be it husband, wife, nephew, uncle, 
sister, brother, whatever. If your husband had his wife, his daughter, his sister, his aunt removed from their home and brought back after being sodomized, raped, or whatever the case may be, and then discovered that his wife, sister, or daughter was bearing a child out of love and wedlock and had to be forced and had that child from the time that they were standing, had to stand in the cotton fields and pick cotton yeah. or to watch his brother, his uncle, or a close friend be tarred and feathered in front of the family in order to break the soul of a black man. That's you have to look at the fact that many times when you did not see hope, you also thought that giving up was was better than the other option of living this life. That's right. That's right. And it, in in this is a conversation that has been passed on through um, men of Latin, yeah. black, mm -hmm. um, and somehow it's been inherited through, through men men in general. So when you ask why, is that um, we know the minority races don't seek out medical help through therapy. Yeah. So yeah, we don't get a chance to have these conversations. And we also know that in the black community, when you show signs of vulnerability, it's a weakness. Right. And, uh, we seem to not to embrace that as a community. So, right. uh, and that's the reason why I, I said this conversation needs to be had. Absolutely. The ho holidays seem to, to, to carry a little extra weight. And I always they said, do. being a black man, even in my position yeah. that I'm in right now, being a black man in today's America is an adventure. And it is, yeah. if you want to be honest, if that had been black people uh, attacking um, um, the Nation's White House, yeah, yeah. We, we, we will still be burying our, our, our children. Yeah, we will. Yeah, it's a very different story. Than the issue. So mm -hmm. you know, as much as we want to talk about it, but let's go back to your, your family. You're one mm -hmm. of eight children. I had the youngest of nine children. One of my oldest brother, he passed away. Uh, a Catholic family, ago. I take it. A big Catholic family, that's exactly right. Yeah, and there are uh, 11 on my mom's side, even though she was Baptist, there are 11 on my mom's side and 15 on my dad's side. And that's where the Catholic um, side came in with the Kennys. Now, I, I don't want to trigger um, anything, but we, we did agree to talk about this story. All right. Sure. Um, your your father took his life, all right? He did. Everyone's going to ask why, you know, how did it happen? Um, right. Who discovered your father? And t tell us about that day that you discovered uh, or found out your father had uh, had passed away. And what was, what was your reaction? And what were you feeling when you found out he took his life? So that's what I had to do some research on and go back on because things... Um, Grief and death were handled in the Black community a little bit differently back then. They were um, a little hush-hush for the children. And the children weren't allowed to really mourn or know what was going on uh, overall. And so literally our, ha our siblings were split in half. The older four children were allowed to go to the funeral, but the younger children were not allowed to go to the funeral. So we were um, mm -hmm. ushered off to... Uh, a neighbor's house, um, a lady, a very nice lady who lived right behind us who also uh, had daycare. And so she immediately took us in. And I was wondering why I didn't see mom for a while. Um, my mom was kind of ushered and put to the side and I didn't see her uh, for a while. And for me, um, that was the piece that I remember. It was just a moment in time where I remember I was away from my mom and everybody else was caring for me except for my mom and my dad. And so for me, it was like, what happened during that time? And not until uh, I was probably like seven or eight as I was growing up, did one of my siblings just tell me, dad's not coming home. He eventually is not coming home. Um, and this is why. And so um, I had that as a kind of a, side conversation uh, with one of my siblings. Nobody officially came and told us, the younger ones, um, what really happened. It was like, kind of just go back to life and they're gonna find out eventually through their siblings, through the older siblings. And that's exactly what happened. But, um, you know, I think when it did happen, it was very disappointing um, to, 
you know, know that I would never see my father again, was a very um, fun loving person. Um, but I really felt bad for my mother and uh, everything that she was going through um, at the time. So uh, life went on. It was like the elephant in the room that nobody ever spoke about for several years. And um, I went on through life um, having to answer questions like, where is your dad? And why isn't he at the father-daughter dance? I went to all girls private school. Um, and there were um, moments where your father should be included, but I did not have that opportunity and I had to explain it. So um, that some of that angered me and I kept feeding into a little bit more anger, like darn it, we got to figure out what exactly happened with this whole thing. So for me going through, you know, uh, uh, school, finishing school and getting on my with career with training, I'm an instructional designer. I've been doing training for over 30 years, working in hospitals. I'm also a healthcare interpreter um, and speak Spanish fluently. And I really was doing more writing in the world of training. Um, but I always had this little thing nagging in the back of my head, like, what happened? I want to know what really happened. Uh, and so not until my 30s did I start doing a lot more research. Like, I want to see a police report. I want to see this. I want to see exactly what went down. And so literally over 10 years, 10, 15 years, um, I've been kind of figuring out how to pull this subject together into um, a writing. But again, um, I had a lot of people uh, coaxing me to write the book and, you know, go ahead and get it together. And I had lots of notes and everything, but not until I saw January 6th, everything that was happening there on the television set. And I say that at the beginning of the book, it was startling. It was shocking. It became and it was a like, trigger. Darn it, this is the same. Yeah, it, it did. It was very triggering. So it was the same thing. Like, darn it, aren't we? I'm, I feel like I'm going through deja vu. Like this is happening again. And so that was um, the spark, the catalyst that made me sit down and really pull all my notes together. I literally had stickies everywhere and I had three or four folders with all, all these notes and uh, articles, things from Cincinnati. I've relocated back to Cincinnati for a minute, did research. I came back here to the East Coast and that, that thing was still nagging me in the back of my brain, like, get the book done, get the book done, get the book done. But January 6th is the thing that said, darn it, this is it. You're going to start allocating time to sit down and write the book. Write well, the book, I, put it together. I am very happy that whatever was inside you was nagging for this to come out. And I always tell people, you know, if you want to tell a secret, put it in the page of a book. And that's what authors do. Because when an author writes a book, the whole motivation of writing a book is because they've been through something and they think oh, yeah. they have a story to tell that will make a difference in your life. And this time of year, during the holidays, like I said, it becomes heavy, becomes pressing for some people. But, you know, you always want to think, how could I have done something? How can I avoid it? Something um, we, we are all so busy with our own lives. We, we don't see the signs. Um, are, are there any telltale signs? of something that people, our listeners should be looking for? Um, because I, I know with every situation, um, there's a tell, it's like a poker game, mm -hmm. you, you know, your facial expression, whatever. I know through my own personal experience, I don't know if I'm going to share that or, or, or not, but there were telltale signs. They weren't yeah. um, blatant, but they were obvious to people that care. Can you yeah. give us some ideas on what family members and friends should be looking for or be concerned when these these signs show up? I think um, some of them that, and I learned these from my brothers and sisters and from my my, um, my mom and what she was experiencing are just weird things happening, acting out of character um, and doing things that, that um, normally aren't something that that person is typical of. My father was normally jovial, loved music, and we would play and dance in the living room or whatever. He stopped doing those things after a while. When you stop um, seeing the person enjoying life or the little things that they used to like, take enjoyment in in life, and they're not doing those things anymore, that's a big signal too. Um, I think the isolation and lack of communication and when you don't see the person or 
They don't, when you do see them, they don't want to talk a lot. That's a, that's a sign too. And I think, um, you know, your loved one and you know, their patterns, you know, the things that they normally like and don't like, or it's, you know, sometimes allowing some things to happen to them that normally they would stand up for or say something about, and they're just kind of letting things like watching life go by. Um, when you're seeing the person kind of regress into this um, level of inactivity or disconnection um, and, you know, where they used to be upbeat, jovial and smiling, they're not doing that anymore. Those are some signs to approach the person and have a um, really open, loving conversation with them and letting them know that they can always come to you and they can always reach out to you and that there are other resources that are out there as well, too. So tell that is one thing that I want to do with this book. Is tell to tell me about those around. resources. Yeah, I wanted to turn it around and um, let people know that um, they don't have to be alone. They can reach out to anyone. Um, so your resources are your faith um, and they your faith community um, and your family, of course. And so faith, family, and love is what I put right on the cover of the book because me and my siblings, that really is all that we leaned on. We leaned on one another. Um, and so we have to realize that we need to be the resource for one another, as well as know that we can reach out to one another and get some resources from one another. But for anyone who is out there in crisis, for anyone who is struggling, um, for any young people who are trying to decide what they want to do with their life, and maybe some people are against what you really want to do with, with your life, um, but for all of those folks who are in crisis, you remember that you have resources. The main one is the suicide hotline with the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. That is out there and available 1-800-273-TALK, which is 8255. But now they've simplified it where you can just dial 988. That's all you gotta do is dial 988. And you can have a counselor there that will speak to you and guide you through some better options than this highly impactful um, suicide decision that you would want to make. Don't do that. My slogan is, please don't do as such. We love you way too much. And know that there are a lot of people out there that do. Uh, they love you way too much. So reach out, uh, call a family member, call a friend, call a total stranger uh, on the uh, 800 hotline. You can also call the Trevor Project. Trevor Project is at 866-488-7386. And we'll be repeating and sharing those uh, that information. It's online. All you got to do is Google National Suicide Prevention Hotline. There's someone out there to talk to you. There's someone out there to comfort you. We all love you. Uh, so please, if I say one life um, and one person for making some adverse decisions and hurting themselves. Um, um, that's my message. That's what I really want to get across uh, with the book. Yeah, I speak about racial unity. I speak about us loving and caring for one another, but the suicide prevention and awareness, um, really very important for us all to be aware about that. La conciencia y la prevención de suicidio. All right, thank so, you. Yeah, right, that's thank my you. message in English and in Spanish, trying to get it out there. All right. Um, with, with that said, because we're, we're talking about men and men are, are, are at risk because we're carrying a heavy burden. And I, I can only speak yeah. because I'm a black man um, reaching out to these sources. And I'm going to say this, Trevor Project, I have tried to contact you um, before and would love to hear from you. I did a whole series yeah. on uh, suicide with teens and uh, trafficking and have yet to hear from you. So I would love, love to be able to showcase and talk about um uh, your story and your involvement in um, suicide prevention. And again, that number, on put it on speed dial, is 988. But the question I want to ask you, because Black men, as a culture, I'm not saying all men, we don't reach for help. We don't ask for help. Yeah. You know, my grandfather um, said, when you get to a point you can help someone, reach one, teach one. 
And this is the motivation behind this, is to reach one, teach one. When we are in crisis as a Black person, a Black male, you know, we think less of ourselves if I have to pick up the phone and go 911 or 988 or call the national hotline at 800-273-8255. But I may come home and I may look at my wife in her loving eyes, I'm looking at you, we're just going hypothetically. And I may come to you and go, I'm tired. I'm just tired. My you father know, did that with my mom a lot. All, all of this is going on. Mm -hmm. Or um, you get a random phone call and saying, um, you know, Naomi, you know, I've had a great life. I really enjoy it. I appreciate you. And um, you mean a lot to me. And um, I don't ever want you to forget that. Or you randomly call all of your children and you say this and whatever. And because we have our own distractions, we do not acknowledge the conversation we're, we're having at hand. It's like an argument. We seem to always yeah, be defending or supporting our position. And the yeah, reason why I said it the way that I said it is because I was in a dark place at one time. And I did this. All right. So... Um, you said your dad did this. So give yeah, us some of the tell, tell some of the telltale signs. And and I want to circle back to these preventions because who makes the phone call? Do you make it on the behalf of that person that you're concerned? Or is it the responsibility of that person? And he has to act as an activist on his own behalf. I think you mentioned before being a strong black man, you know, wanting to be able to take care of his family and he has lots of children, uh, imagine being in that position. And when you step out the door to try and go and get at work, go and get housing for your family, to go and feed your family, there are so many points of oppression outside of there. And you still go back home to nine children. I imagine that must have been just like really very stressful for him uh, and for any black man really at that time trying to um, take care of their family, do what any other family man wants to do, uh, regardless of color, trying to take care of his family, pay the bills, be a good source for his family, his children, and his wife. My father was very diligent, um, uh, very disciplined at a lot of things. He That trickled down to all of us um, and being able to keep things very clean and making sure the house is very orderly. But after a while, when he stepped outside the house, chaos. There's a lot of chaos that he would encounter at every point. So I imagine when I was going back through all of this, I was thinking he must have really been literally losing his mind trying to maintain all of this over here with our loving family, trying to be a good role model for his children. And then when he steps out to society, nobody wants to support him uh, in that regard. And so there are some societal things that we have to do, I think to lower the level of uh, suicides, the lower level of shooting incidents that are occurring, just the level of violence, domestic violence that is occurring out there. There's just too many frustrations of where people are not being supported, specifically Black males um, out in the community. And again, it happened in 67. It is still happening now. It's like we have not learned uh, from our lesson. So there are so many things that uh, can trigger a lot of people, um, but specifically for Black men, um, and I can't imagine being in that position, you would know that I got to take care of my family. I got to look strong for them. I got to be the role model and strong for my wife and, you know, everyone around me, but I don't, where am I going to get my strength from? So um, he was a great man of faith and everything, but really, societal socially there are lots there needs to be a lot more resources um out there available to everyone in crisis but really individually for one another we need to just care for and love one another respect one another a whole lot more i think it gets down to that basic golden rule about treating others how you want to be treated but and we just me, really have a hard time with that lesson today let me ask this question <laughs> We've had this conversation before when you talk about faith. You said he was a strong person of faith. And the greatest gift that God has given us is life. So the biggest insult 
is the taking of that life, either voluntarily or in, involuntarily. How how can those those conversations exist in the two spaces? That was the main question that I had, being a woman of faith and trying to understand where my father's head was and making that decision. It's an answer that I will never get. And it's an answer that a lot of people who are surviving from suicide, they don't know what was going through um, the head of that, that person um, or how they felt like they were uh, at their wits end. But the only thing that I do know about um, individuals who commit suicide is that they feel that there is so much pain over here that they feel like that they will not have all of that pain and pressure on the other side. And so it must be such an extremity of pain over here that is beyond anything that you and I can comprehend or faith can comprehend. But um, for me, I know for me, um, and I can only personally speak for myself, I will never make that decision because I feel like with my faith, that is not my decision. That is God's decision uh, when my life should end. Everyone doesn't think that way. Everyone is dealing with their daily pains and everyone is not able to lean into their faith and just know that the next day will be better. I've learned to do that over time. And some of that takes faith. It takes learning about scripture and the word and uh, fellowship with others that are more positive and being in that circle of um, positivity and support. And I really think that we ought to let that ripple and let that get bigger and bigger all across our country because our country is really struggling uh, with that. Where we, like Rodney King, why, why can't we just get along and try and help one another uh, and be able to be that support for one another? I know for a fact that we would have fewer incidences uh, of these suicides, violent issues, things like that. Well, I, I'm well, gonna, I'm going to say this. Because, I'm going to say this, and I and I you know I'm going to say I know this interview is not uh, about me, but I will say this to our listeners because we have someone out there that's sitting on the ed edge of the fence, and for someone that has been to a dark side of themselves, yeah. I would be the first person to, to say that I I I walked around and I said, you know, in our own truth, we live a lie. Because yeah, we always right. say what, what we'll never, ever do until we get in a situation that we question what we just said that we'll never, ever do. And that's I'm right. a victim and I'm a hero of the same conversation that's because right. um, I was injured at a point. I had five surgeries and I was in such a dark place because um, life had been challenged. My personal life was in, in, in crisis. Um, I was going through uh, a situation that affected my, my kids. And it was so dark, I couldn't see the light of day. Wow. And I always said that if you ever, if, if somehow I just popped up dead, I said, do, do an autopsy, investigate, because I would never take my own life. But when you get to that point, when you lose hope, and you see no other option, it's just easier to unload what you're carrying than to carry on. But I, wow. I will tell you this. Sometimes when someone close to you that you're listening to, it could be your therapist, it could be the National Suicide Hotline, a counselor on that line, it could be someone you love and respect, will tell you, don't jump, come back, take my hand, and I will walk you through life the same way God has walked us through through life. That's what I'm trying to do. You have a reconnection with your inner faith mm -hmm. and your faith is yeah. true. That's you what I'm trying to do. You have to justify living. And when Absolutely. I when I go through and I say that some of the most successful people that I, I know in business, some of the many authors that I've read books um, about, you know, people like my good friend, Les Brown, we have all been to that dark place when it was oh, yeah. easier to, to check out and for something. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who sends the messenger. That's how you respond. That messenger shows up and it was my children that, that kept me here. And Theo, I know who the messenger is. Yep, um, the messenger, and and God works in mysterious ways, and He speaks for That's other exactly people. right. So I I will That's say exactly that right. way. So I I am I'm saying to you the reason why um, we're doing this because of the holidays, it's uh -huh. it, it's messy. Um, the life it that is. we're living right now, it's messy. 
we are divided when there's conversations such as Naomi's book is trying to unite people. And I have my own issues with united people because, you know, we argued about this. Um, we had a strong discussion about this before we did the uh -huh. podcast about uh -huh. to prove to everyone, at least on my end, that we can't be united. We couldn't say to save our, our, our world, our humanity, to wear a mask or not wearing a mask. So uh, we were called on unity. But there's a strong population of people that live their life beyond racial differences. And there's a strong population of people that live beyond our own personal bias within our own cultures, our skin color, our eye colors. You know, we're mixed in this and that and whatever. And there's a strong population of people that will love over hate. Mm -hmm. Naomi. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Naomi. Can I mention one thing? Um, there's one thing that you said about, um, you know, the decision that my father made and, you know, uh, with his faith and everything. And um, I'm not sure, you know, why he made that decision, whatever, but there, there, it did come to a point where I had to uh, settle myself that that's the decision he made. Um, I don't know why I still love him, um, but I I am trying to uh, turn around and do something with that and make it different for me. So for me, I like you said, all of us have been through a difficulty in life. We've been had a dark point in life. For me, when I lost my mother, I didn't mention that too in the book. Uh, I talk about me becoming an orphan at sixteen. So I lost both my parents um, by the time I was sixteen. So it was a really dark time for me as well, too. Um, but for me, it's about people getting good coping mechanisms for where they can be able to help themselves and know to reach out uh, in those difficult moments. And so I hope that all of us are able to learn what some of those coping mechanisms can be. And there's different for every person. Some of it is prayer. Some of it is athleticism, getting a lot of physical frustration out. Some of it is leaning on your faith. Some of it is getting close to family, um, and getting good, pe positive people around you. It's just a combination of lots of things. Getting into your work or what you do positively. Look for those positive uh, coping mechanisms. And that's what I did. And so that's what I'm trying to turn around and share in the book as well. And that we all have our dark spaces. We are, Look at Jesus Christ and what he had to go through uh, overall. Nothing compared to what we are dealing with here. So we need to carry our cross, know that there's someone there to support us. We must reach out and know that there are resources there for you to do so. And so me being a trainer, uh, a person who informs people, tells you about specific steps to get more positive and get more knowledgeable. Of course, I wanted to put that into a book to make sure that I was telling people we're all going to hit a low point. We all are going to, it's like human nature, especially as you get to be an adult. Definitely as you're going through teen stages, young adult, but all throughout your adult life. And we need to find out how to deal with that. And uh, hopefully we are reaching out. We got mental health specialists that are out there that can, or just therapists who can help you talk through some basic issues. But sometimes we over escalate things. And um, on our own, we make really bad decisions before things get to escalating. I agree. I Please. agree. And, and before we wrap up, I want I, I want people to know how to get in touch with you, because I know you are a paid public speaker. I know that you speak multiple languages, so you can speak English and Spanish. And I know you teach teach those things. Um, I, I want to because you're the expert on here. I'm just a fly on the wall. Um, and I, I'm the portal to the, the next level of your conversation. Uh, and before we close, I want to make sure that if you're thinking about um, ending your life, I want you to understand the impact of that decision on your people that are still left here to bear your cross. So before we go on and wrap up um, this interview, will you please tell everyone, Naomi uh, Kennedy, how to get your book? where they can find you if they want to hire you for public speaking how to reach you real quick sure. mm -hmm. absolutely um i am um naomi kinney instructional designer the cptd is certified professional and talent development so i do i do a lot of work a lot of public speaking overall 
uh, for a lot of different professional development subjects. Um, but the grief counseling is a new one that's recently been added. So uh, my book, Kids of King, again, Kids of King, Faith and Family and Love. We'll see you through it all. It is available on Barnes and Noble uh, and also on Amazon and Kindle. So if you just Google it, um, it will come up. I am also available via email at njkreaders21 at gmail.com. You can also reach me at Instagram at Nay Kenny and also on Twitter at Nay Kenny as well, too. And then Facebook and LinkedIn, just my full name. So um, I am also at 301 832 0127. If you want to reach me directly um, to engage me to um, learn Spanish or um, to speak, uh, of course engagement on any of the uh, professional developments that I do uh, or on grief counseling, save a life and have people lean into their faith, family, and loving one another. I would like to leave uh, everyone with one quote from no, we're not, we're uh, not John done. 13. Verse we're not, we're not done I, yet. Oh, can I do that? I'll do that no, at the end. Okay. We're not done. We're not done yet. Okay. Um, okay. Let, let me ask this because it's so, so important. Yeah. All right. Okay. That people understand when you take your life, there's a reaction to your action, okay? I want you to speak from a child that just lost her, her father. And I want you to speak to a person that's sitting on the edge of their chair or either, you know, with a rope behind their neck and I'm going to be kind of graphic or a gun pointing to their head or a handful of pills in the, in the palm of their hand. Mm -hmm. Before you make that next decision, I want you to understand that if you have an eight-year-old daughter, you have a wife, you have a brother, a best friend, when you leave this world or they get notice that you've taken your own life, tell the world how, how you felt and how you're feeling, what bear, what cross you're carrying with you through the rest of your life of that person's decision. And some say it's selfish. What do you say, Naomi? Yeah, three, at three years old, um, yeah, you pulled the rug out from under me. Um, you took the wind out of my sails. Um, you uh, really, um, uh, you um, gave a bad impression to all of us that um, you didn't feel like your presence was important. And you were wrong. You were very wrong. And I want to let you know, I don't know what kind of troubles you're going through or how mad I am at you. I just still want you to be here. I don't want you to go anywhere. Um, I want us to work things through. So don't leave your children behind. Don't leave your family, uh, loved ones behind. Don't um, give everyone a uh, wrong impression of you as a person. Uh, you want to show people that you can work it through, that you can persevere, and that uh, you're willing to go through and carry across and go through some difficulties uh, difficulties that are typical in life, but you're willing to do that for your children and for your family um, so that they're not feeling horrible and lost and confused and having to answer all these awful questions throughout their whole life um, just because of the decision that you want to make right now. So again, please don't do as such. We love you way too much. You may not think so, but we know so. And uh, we know that there's a way out a lot better than what you're thinking about doing right now. And, and that's the word <clears throat> of a young lady that is still living with the consequences of her father taking his own life. She has written a book, Kids of King, Naomi Kinney, Naomi J. Kennedy. And uh, it's at Barnes and Nobles. You can look up that. We'll give you the um, the, the link when we release the podcast, it's also on Amazon. It's also on uh, Kindle. Remember, you um, don't have to bear this alone. Talk to someone. Put eight. Put nine eight eight on your speed That's dial. It. Go to the project. Call them. Talk to one of those counselors. Talk mm -hmm. to someone that can give you some help because you are loved. I want, I'm going to repeat it. We love you. I would not be doing this podcast if I didn't think That's right. the story that Naomi is telling would help someone else. 
And as a black man, we're too proud to ask for help. And I'm going to say that's stupid um, pride. Please ask for help. Stupid pride. I'm going to say it again. It is wow. stupid pride. You're not that big. Just think, if I had not been here today, this conversation between Naomi and myself would not exist. And we would not be able to help someone get through troubled times. Call Naomi. And I would not be wiping away tears 40-something years later still from the impact of what you did. So and, please don't do that. And I'm going to tell you, anyone, be it male or female, look at Naomi's tears. You are taking the easy way out. The people that yeah. actually suffer are the people you leave behind. Naomi, Absolutely. I always ask this of all my guests. And the reason why I ask this, because, you know, everyone that does podcasts or social media, we're looking for people to like, follow, subscribe and everything else. I'm no right. different. You know, I'm right. no different. I want you to make comments. I want you to go to RMK Productions and network and subscribe. But I want you to keep this in mind. I have a very selective group of people that follow and listen to this podcast or RMK Productions. They're not people that drive by an accident. They're people with a higher call to action. They stop and help. So if you're one of those individuals, feel free to follow, subscribe, and share this uh, podcast. If you're not one of those individuals, watch this um, podcast or any others until you become one of those individuals. So Naomi, with that said, I asked my guests, if you had one ask, A-S-K, and I always say ask big, if you had a dream to come true, yeah. have some idea of what you're going to say. And then I'm going to ask you to leave our listeners with a little something before I sign off. Tell me what your ask would be, A-S-K. I'm sorry. Ask, reach out. Reach out and know that um, you need other human beings. You cannot live life alone in a vacuum and um, deal with all of the challenges that life is throwing at us and that we create for ourselves uh, as well, too. But you do need your family members. And I am so blessed to um, have been uh, raised in a really big family. And that is one thing I definitely do want to thank my father for is for all of my siblings is um, because I don't I don't know how I would have even uh, gotten through um, all of the challenges just growing up dealing with the stigma of suicide uh, in our family. So um, I really encourage everybody to just reach out, use all your resources, know that you are not alone and. Uh, please don't do as such. That's my ask. Please don't do as such. We love you way too much. And, and I know you want to leave our <laughs> with a little something before uh, we sign off. So um, if you may, I'm going to surrender the mic to you again. Okay. Cool. Yeah, one thing, I always like to leave a little bit of scripture with everyone. I know people are carrying their crosses um, and I know everybody is dealing with their challenges and we're all so busy. We feel like we don't have time to help other people, but we really do. And so I want to just reiterate a few words that Jesus told us here in John 13, verses 34, 35. This is Jesus speaking. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye merely have love for one another. So there's a really basic request, or that's the ask from above, really, is for us to love one another. And I think, um, if again, if we did a whole lot more of that, we would see a whole lot fewer of these awful statistics uh, that are coming out every day when you turn on the news, not to mention people who are taking their own lives. So uh, be less destructive to one another. Be less destructive to yourselves. And again, yeah, just love one another. Be Go out there and be an angel for someone, anyone, uh, because, yeah, somebody needs you. Yeah. Naomi Kinney, um, I want to thank you um, 1,000 times over for um, coming and gracing us and blessing us with your presence. For those of you out there, please get her book, Kids of King by Naomi J. Kinney. K-I-N-N-E. It's on Barnes and Noble, Kindle, and Amazon. I want to preach, I want to say to my listeners and loyal fans, we appreciate you and hope yes. that you've enjoyed this episode and people you should know. If you know of anyone 
who has a story that we should feature, please go to our homepage at info at rmkproductions.org. Give us that information. And Naomi, you're more than welcome. If you have someone you'd like to recommend to this show, please share this and bring them on. Okay. I'm always open to a story that needs to be told. Okay. Um, our struggle as human beings um, in this country is real. The struggle of being black in this country is real. Change only happens within people that are open to change. And sometimes when you say you want to make something great again, it's got to start with you and making that great again. And if it doesn't unite people, it separates people. And if you're not doing your job to enhance or, or, or bring people and share love, you, you damage humanity. So um, when I say that the struggle is a never ending process, freedom is uh, never really won, it's earned. And how we win is that we create a new generation of people that love one another. So with that said, find 1000 reasons to be kind to someone. My grandfather, Joseph Phillips, the late Joseph Phillips, um, always taught me, he said, when you get to a point in life, you can help someone else. He said, it's your duty to do so. Sure. Reach one, teach one. And with that said, again, I'll thank everyone. Thank you, Naomi. And we'll thank feed you. the black and we're out. Thank you. Thank you.